time, baby. Here we go. Ram Jam Slam Bam. It's awesome, baby. This is American Freedom News with Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect newscast in America, reporting global and national news too hot for television, standing up for faith, family, and freedom, defending our Constitution and patriotic heritage, exposing corruption, and tracking the latest global developments. Chinese espionage, bioterrorism, solar storms, West Nile virus, UN gun control, a common currency for North and South America, and the coming global government. American Freedom News, the radio program on the cutting edge of today's news. And now, live from his studio in Granbury, Texas, here's the founder and president of American Freedom News, Rick Wiles. Welcome to uh, today's program. Uh, as we're talking, the, the officials, top brass at the Pentagon, are meeting to discuss some of the most recent terrorist threats that have come uh, from militant Muslims in the Middle East today against U.S. Uh, personnel that are stationed in the Middle East, particularly in Yemen, and the investigation of the blast of the USS Cole. We have a number of reports uh, concerning the Cole today. More revelations coming out, more holes in the government's story about the blast of the USS Cole on October 12th. Now, yesterday, a major uh, revelation came out. And that is that the top analyst at the Pentagon's Defense Intelligence Agency resigned in disgust the day after the USS Cole blast because he was furious that his warnings about a an imminent terrorist attack, particularly towards a U.S. vessel in the Yemen area, was not passed on to the USS Cole. Washington Times reporting today. An analyst at the Pentagon's Defense Intelligence Agency resigned in protest after the attack on the USS Cole because his warnings of, in, of pending terrorist attacks in the Persian Gulf were unheeded. During a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing yesterday, Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas read portions of the letter of resignation. The letter is now in the hands of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Senator Roberts quoted the letter as saying the analyst had, quote, significant analytical differences with his superiors over the DIA terrorist threat assessment. The senator said, quote, he indicates his analysis could have played a critical role in the uh, DIA, that's the Defense Intelligence Agency's ability to predict and warn of a potential terrorist attack against U.S. interests. And he goes further to say he is, quote, very troubled by the many indicators contained in the analysis that suggest two or three other major acts of terrorism could potentially occur in the coming weeks or months. The Washington Times article says the agent's assessment was at least the second warning of terror attacks in the region that circulated inside the Clinton administration but never reached the Coles crew. Senators questioned administration witnesses about a report in the Washington Times yesterday that said the National Security Agency issued a top-secret report hours after the coal was attacked. And that report said terrorists were planning and organizing attacks on U.S. interests in the Gulf. Walter Slocum, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, confirmed the message's existence, but he took issue with how the Times characterized it. Slocum said, I have seen the message in question, and I think it's highly questionable whether those messages constitute what the Washington Times story says they constitute. Whatever that means. General Tommy Franks, commander of U.S. Gulf Forces, said that if he had, if he had, had such a message, he would have ordered force protection measures. General Franks told the senators, quote, if that message contained those specific factors that indicated not only intent, but that there was an, an attack imminent, yes, Senator, we would have taken immediate action. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, on top of all of the other reports that have been out. They clearly indicated that there were people inside the U.S. government in the Pentagon and, and other agencies warning that, Muslim terrorists were going to launch some type of attack in the very near future against U.S. vessels. Osama bin Laden produced a videotape which was aired on, on Arab satellite television 
back in September where uh, Osama bin Laden told his, his followers to go ahead with the plans to bring down a U.S. ship. That's just one of the indications that, that the military and, and the State Department and the CIA and everybody else in, in Washington had in their hands. But for some reason, as we've been asking this question over and over since October 12th, for some reason, somebody in Washington felt it important that the USS Cole break away from the fleet of the George Washington and sail alone to the port of Aden in Yemen on the very day that the Middle East was exploding in bloodshed and violence. Again, it seems extremely uh, suspicious that the USS Cole sailed into the port of Aden at force level Bravo, second from the bottom in security alert status. With all this information in their hands, they still sent the crew of the USS Cole into that into that terrorist-filled city at the lowest, uh, next to the lowest security alert. And, and apparently this, uh, this information in the hands of this analyst at the Pentagon's Defense uh, Intelligence Agency was so serious that the man resigned the very next day after the blast. He was so angry, so disgusted uh, with the Pentagon and, and the White House for not warning the crew of the USS Cole. As I've said uh, a number of times, you have to come to the conclusion that either we've got top brass in the military and top officials in the Pentagon who are either buffoons and and are not capable of running the military to uh, protect our sailors, or somebody wanted the USS Cole blown up. There are too many discrepancies. Listen, that ship is not the only thing... It's not the only thing in this case that's got big holes in it. There are some major holes in the in the official story coming out of Washington about the blast, particularly that two-hour discrepancy in the timeline of the blast. Now, I'm going to talk about it later in the program. I'm going to go to I'm going to read line for line some of the testimony uh, or some of the statements at press conferences uh, October 12th and 13th by. Uh, Ken Bacon and Admiral Clark and Secretary Cohen, and we're going to go over their statements line by line, and, and, and you'll see the deliberate deception that those guys were putting out October 12th and October 13th, and they did not change their story for eight days until the Navy Times newspaper confronted them with the evidence that the ship was blown up two hours later than what the military was telling us. Those are major discrepancies. And for it to go on eight days is just, uh, it. well, how else can you explain that? As I said on yesterday's program, Admiral, Admiral Clark, I think it was Admiral Clark, Chief of Navy Operations, was asked the day after the blast uh, what the, 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 the commander of the USS Cole, Commander Lepold, had told him about the blast, and he said, I haven't talked to him yet. He's a very busy man. And... Uh, I just haven't had an opportunity to talk to him, and I found that extremely suspicious that the chief of naval operations didn't have the opportunity to talk to the commander of a ship that was blown up and lost 17 men and women. You know, and then they tried to then they tried to 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 blame it on uh, the communication. You know, saying that well, you know, everything was in chaos there, and you know, we just uh, had uh, uh, trouble communicating for eight days. As though Commander Lepold was uh, standing down there on the dock of, of, of Aden, you know, at the only payphone in the city of Aden, you know, the one next door to the uh, Camel Hump Bar and Grill, you know, waiting to make a phone call to Washington and, and all the top brass at the Pentagon standing around twiddling their thumbs saying, I wonder when he's going to get a chance to get to the payphone and call us. We'd like to know what happened to our ship. I don't buy this story. New York Times today says a Pentagon intelligence agents, agent resigned one day after terrorists bombed the destroyer Koh in Yemen, protesting that his superiors had ignored his warnings of an imminent threat to American forces in the region. The resignation of the analysts who monitored terrorist threats in the region 
raises new questions on Capitol Hill about whether the Pentagon and intelligence agencies have have done more to avert the attack or could have done more to avert the attack on the coal. The analyst identified as, as Kai C. Thales had not warned of a specific threat against the coal or an attack, defense officials said. Rather, they said he concluded from intelligence reports that there was a strong possibility of an attack. Well, you know, for this gentleman to resign the very next day from, from the top intelligence analyst position in the Pentagon, for him to resign a, 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 a job that important tells me that uh, whatever he told them was very specific, and he was angry, and he was disgusted, and he was furious. And I, I'd like to have been a mouse in, inside the Pentagon that day and heard what this gentleman would have said to his superiors. The article says senior Pentagon officials testified during House and Senate hearings that were at times contentious. And officials also disclosed that American intelligence agencies had issued two other warnings of a terrorist attack in the region, one the day before the coal was bombed, the second one hours afterwards. And I want to say something to, to our listeners. You folks are doing an incredible job. Uh, first of all, uh, the number of hits on our website just skyrocketing. Thank you so much because you're spreading the word uh, to your friends uh, all over the country, and people are flocking to our website. They're looking at the information we're posting about the USS Cole. But the, but the thing that you're really doing, a lot of you have emailed and uh, to me or, or called and left messages telling me that you have called your congressman or your senator's office and told them to go to AmericanFreedomNews.com and look at the information we have about the USS Cole. And I think enough people have done this Something is stirring in Washington because uh, yesterday's news or yesterday's television, uh, uh, the C-SPAN coverage showed several senators and congressmen, including Roscoe Bartlett. And Congressman Bartlett was on this program as a guest several months ago. Congressman Bartlett was furious yesterday. He was not accepting uh, their um, spin out of the out of the Pentagon. And so you folks are doing an incredible job. Keep it up. Keep, uh, keep calling Congress. Keep calling your senators. Send them emails. Call their offices. Send them letters. Tell them that we want to know the truth about the USS Cole. Don't forget, they're all up for re-election in just two weeks. Don't let them sit. Put a little fire under them and make them answer uh, the questions. Here's another Washington Post report. U.S. had hints of possible attacks before coal was hit. U.S. intelligence agencies repeatedly picked up indications of a possible terrorist attack in the Persian Gulf in the days and weeks before the October 12th bombing of the coal. But the warnings were not always relayed to military commanders. A Pentagon counterterrorism specialist resigned in protest after the day of the attack because... His superiors refused to give the Navy information. His superiors refused to give the Navy the information he believed might have averted the bombing. In another case, an intelligence report was issued just 12 hours before the coal bombing, indicating possible terrorist activity in Yemen. But it was not considered specific enough to call off the coal's visit to the port of Aden, said Walter Slocum. Listen, I've said for nearly two weeks now, heads need to roll in the Pentagon, and heads need to be rolling in the, uh, in the State Department and at the White House. Seventeen coffins rolled down the aisle of churches to their graves. And the least that can be done here is that some heads of top brass and some bureaucrats also roll in the next couple weeks as somebody held... Somebody should be held responsible for this. You know, it would be. You know, it would do us some good. You know, to to uh, bring some of the Japanese values into our government because with the Japanese and their government and and in their corporations, when a CEO or an executive is is found to be negligent, you know what the first thing the Japanese do? They resign. They resign in shame. And they don't wait until the lynch mob is outside 
uh, with the noose ready to drag them out. No, they have a code of honor, and they say, I take responsibility for this, and I am, I'm ashamed of this. I've been negligent, and I am resigning my position. Well, listen, <laughs> Bill Clinton, you couldn't shame that man into resignation if you had a videotape of him in, in, in child molestation. And the news media would uh, explain it away. They would say child molestation does not rise to the level of an impeachable offense. When I come back, I've got more reports. Uh, there have been terrorist threats yesterday and today against the FBI in Yemen. I'll give you the details when I come back, and I'm going to tell you what a member of the Russian Duma said this week about the Communist Party connections in Russia with Al Gore. You'll hear it today on American Freedom News. American Freedom News is your alternative source for news. We investigate the news that television networks are afraid to report. Keep tuned to this station. Rick will be back with more global news. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the citizen reporter on the cutting edge of today's news. History was made on today's date. Stay tuned for an American Minute with Bill Federer. On this day, October 26, 1774, the Provincial Congress of Massachusetts reorganized their defense with one-third of their regiment being Minutemen. They were known as such because they would be ready to fight at a minute's notice. The Congress charged the Minutemen, you are placed by providence in the post of honor because it is the post of danger. The eyes not only of North America and the whole British Empire, but all of Europe are upon you. Let us be solicitous that nothing unbecoming of our characters as Americans, as citizens and Christians be justly chargeable to us. This has been an American Minute with Bill Federer. For a free transcript, call American Minute at one 888 usa word You're listening to Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect news reporter in America. And now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. CNN is uh, reporting today, this is uh, at the time of doing this uh, webcast, uh, concerned about terrorist threats against U.S. forces, the latest being a bomb warning at the Yemen Hotel housing investigators in the attack on the USS Cole. Pentagon leaders Thursday plan to discuss security measures with U.S. military commanders around the world. Using a secure video telecommunication link in the Pentagon, Defense Secretary William Cohen and Army General Henry Shelton uh, were to confer with the commanders of all regional commands. Oh, I wonder why they didn't use that secure video telecommunication link with uh, U.S. military commanders around the world two weeks ago when they were getting these threats of a bomb attack against a U.S. ship. The article, this is CNN, says uh, that includes uh, the U.S. Central Command, which is responsible for U.S. forces in the Middle East. Uh, in Yemen, after a bomb threat was phoned into the Aden Hotel, already tight security was stepped up even further. And then uh, on that same uh, request here, or the same uh, uh, article, uh, the New York Times reporting today security was tightened today, Thursday, around the hotel housing U.S. investigators looking into the attack on the USS Cole. The officials said a telephone th uh, threat from an unknown caller was received around midnight. Yemeni and U.S. security officials held an emergency meeting in the early hours of the morning and adopted new security precautions, including ringing the hotel with machine gun mounted military vehicles and stopping civilian traffic from approaching any closer than 500 yards. The bomb threat to the investigators came as the FBI technicians finished gathering evidence from the ship and were about to head home. After some departures the day before, those remaining uh, at the hotel are around 80 technicians. They're scheduled to leave today. Another report, uh, this is Newsday, Associated Press. Security was tightened today around the hotel. Uh, basically the same uh, information, nothing uh, any different in this. 
uh, says the technicians had been steadily sending evidence to the United States for analysis. Uh, one of the articles I've got on, on our website uh, is, uh, uh, is a translation from BBC News of an interview held on uh, an Arab television channel with the president uh, of, of Yemen, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And he clearly was, well, he was being very diplomatic and, and very firm uh, in in because he's walking a thin line. He was, in the interview, he was saying, look, I've allowed the Americans to come into our country to get their ship, to fix it, to gather evidence, and then leave. They will leave. Uh, but the Arab TV reporter was asking him, uh, isn't it true that the that the military is sending in 10,000 Marines? And he was saying, there will be no base. I am not going to allow a military base in our country. Matter of fact, he said uh, they referred to uh, anybody trying to set up a, a base as occupiers. And he said, Yemen is a graveyard to all occupiers. And he pointed out that he could easily assemble uh, one and a half million uh, Yemeni men who have their own arms and ammunition to deal with any occupation. So the people, the political leaders in Yemen are walking a very thin line because they're trying to let the U.S. government get in there and get that ship out and, and get some evidence. But at the same time, if they look like they're allowing um, the United States to take over their country, they face the possibility of a Muslim uprising in their own land. And we have this, uh, you know, we've got this report on the website that uh, Clinton is sending 10,000 Marines to Yemen. Now, one report I, I've seen says that there are right now 5,000 Marines in Yemen. Well, nobody really is talking about this. Now, I don't know if this is connected to all this stuff going on, but um, Reuters News Service reporting today that more than 300 FBI agents are testing their skills in a simulated extremist attack on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, this uh, FBI mock attack is going on this week. But the FBI says the exercise is not connected to the violence in the Middle East. FBI agent John Rook said the exercise has been scheduled for months. It was just coincidence. Well, what scares me, Agent Rook, is that our um, traitor-in-chief, Maybe he's had this thing scheduled for months, including the bombing of the USS Cole. The article says escalating violence between Palestinians and Israelis and the apparent suicide bombing of the coal have been making headlines this week, while the recent release of millions of barrels of oil from the Strategic, strategic Petroleum Reserve has focused attention on the SPR. Charles Matthew III, special, special agent in charge of the New Orleans FBI Division, said the agency's crisis management unit, located at Quantico, conducts field tests every three years in the region to train agents. Rook said other federal agencies, including the Department of Energy, which controls the four sites of the SPR, are participating in the four-day training program with the 300 agents from Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Alabama. Again, Mock terrorist attacks on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve taking place this week with 300 FBI agents. Uh, New York Times says uh, uh, President Ali Abdul Salah of Yemen said today that preliminary investigations indicated that at least one of the two men who reportedly carried out a suicide bombing on the destroyer coal was an Egyptian and that an unspecified number of Yemenis Egyptians and Algerians and other foreign-born Arabs had been, de had been detained on suspicion of assisting in the attack. Mr. Do uh, President Salah said the inquiry involving the FBI and Yemeni investigators had led to a tentative conclusion that the suspects belonged to an Islamic militant group that he named Islamic Jihad. He identified the groups as Arabs who joined the Arab American-backed Muslim guerrillas that drove Soviet forces from Afghanistan in the 1980s. Yeah, that's the group that the CIA trained and equipped. Remember, the witness who saw the two Arabs go out in that boat, and it was clearly identified on the first day as a Zodiac boat, 
one of the favorite boats of of uh, spies and special op forces. The, the 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 witness who saw that boat go out there, remember the story was it went out to help with the mooring lines. The boat, the USS Cole was just coming into the port. This rubber boat, a Zodiac boat, goes out there to help with the mooring. They were very specific about it. And I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes here. I'm going to read the, the statements of the Pentagon officials. They were very specific about describing the Zodiac boat. Well, that witness, although he's never been named, what I do know is that he is a military attache to the U.S. Embassy in Yemen, which is the capital is in another city. It's not Aden. And whenever I hear attache, I, I automatically think of CIA agent. This thing smells. This thing stinks. Something, um, Something's happening. Something has happened here with the USS Cole that the American people don't know about, that the Congress doesn't know about, that the FBI doesn't know about that much, much of the government doesn't know about, but the shadow government does. The secret shadow government in Washington knows all about it. Washington Post says, President of Yemen said today that an Egyptian man has emerged as the one suspect in the bombing, and it's uh, linked to Osama bin Laden. BBC News, Yemen bomb suspects held by Yemenis. Listen, the only way we're going to get the truth on this thing is to just keep shaking our heads, no. Every time the Pentagon spins a story, we need to shake our heads and go, nope, don't believe it, answer the questions. Let's back up to day one, and let's start answering the questions from the, um, the stories you told the first week. Because you're, you're now on to version 2 or version 3. I don't know how many versions we've got out there now by the Pentagon about what happened. I'm going to get back to this in a few minutes, but uh, let me I'll give you a quick update on what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, this is from Israel. Intelligence community monitoring Iraqi troop movements. This is a, this is a news article out of Israel. As the unrest continues in Israel, the eyes of the Western community are once again focused on the actions of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. Israel and the United States are carefully monitoring Iraqi troop movements on the Iraqi border with Jordan and Syria. A, a senior member of Israel's intelligence community confirmed this on Tuesday. The unnamed senior intelligence official acknowledged that recent Iraqi troop movements may be harmless, but quickly added, that during the Gulf War, he saw, we saw what the Iraqi troops did to Kuwait, adding that the Iraqi force could easily pass through Jordan on its way to Israel. The Israeli Defense Force Intelligence is reporting uh, that they indicate that Saddam may send combat aircraft over heavy population centers, even before advancing ground forces. It is not expected that he would try launching Scud missiles, says this report. It remains uncertain if he has scuds that remain operational. No, he's probably got nukes by now. You know, I, I, I keep asking myself the question. I guess I'm be really becoming cynical uh, about everything that comes out of this, out of this government in Washington. I, you know, I really, I really regret what eight years of Bill Clinton has done to the American people. That we have to question every single report that comes out of Washington because this man is such a liar. You cannot accept on face value any statement out of Washington. And, and sometimes I wonder if Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden are really, uh, you know, the ruthless bad guys that we're told that they that they are, or are they CIA boogeymen? Uh, do they work with the CIA? Do they simply perform their role? You know, as Saddam Hussein told, okay, it's time for you to um, move your troops around. And uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, here, here, are some, uh, here are some missiles you need to use to, to, to damage some U.S. warships. You know, we need you to play your part right now. We're, we're fixing to, to launch uh, World War III. I don't know. I just don't trust anything that comes out of the White House today. Uh, another report says uh, the Fatah faction, aligned with the PLO, has published a new flyer calling for an increase in attacks against Israeli citizens. 
The flyer, which was distributed Wednesday in Ramallah, called for attacks inside Israel. Uh, some, uh, it goes on to say that uh, they're calling for a continuation of the Intifada. Also, we had a today a, a suicide bomb in Israel. BBC News says a Palestinian has died in a suicide bomb attack next to an Israeli army post in the Gaza Strip. The man uh, was reportedly a member of the Islamic Jihad movement, came after Israeli and Palestinian security officials reported no progress in talks between the Israeli and Palestinian security officials. And the, after the attack, an Israeli army spokesman accused the PLO of giving a green light to the bombers by releasing the militants from the Palestinian jails last week. Also, the Palestinians put out a request yesterday asking for the United Nations to come in and help them. Uh, this is on top of the, of the uh, appeal that they made several days ago to the Vatican asking Pope John Paul to intervene in the Middle East problem. Uh, this UPI article says the Palestinian observer to the U.N. Wednesday asked for an urgent meeting of the U.N. Security Council to send a mil- military force uh, to the occupied Palestinian territory, including Jerusalem. Ambassador Syed Hassan of Iraq, speaking on behalf of the League of Arab States, endorsed the Palestinian request for a U.N. military force. And the Red Dragon is sticking its big head into the Middle East. This report from Reuters today says China says that it is supporting the Arab states' strategic choice of dialogue. That's, that's China's words in the Middle East peacekeeping and expresses its concern over the violence against the Palestinians by the Israelis. China's uh, foreign minister said, quote, China supports the Arab states in the dialogue to to solve the problems of the Middle East. Also, behind the scenes, the Russians are are doing a lot of meddling inside the Arab nations. Everybody knows this thing's going to erupt into a global war. And they know the United States will be on the side of Israel, and everybody else is going to be on the side of the Palestinians. And uh, Russia and the Chinese are, are obviously telling the Arabs, we'll line up with you if you will line up with us when we go after the Americans. Guardian Observer says... Uh, uh, Israeli citizens are making their own arrangements to protect themselves. Gun dealers in Jerusalem are reporting that sales of guns and ammunition are up ten times the normal rate. Well, they ought to get some gun control laws there in Israel. Maybe that would stop uh, all that violence, Violence, right? No, the Israeli people know what's coming, and they're out buying guns and ammo because uh, they know it's going to be an all-out war in the streets of Jerusalem. Washington Times says Barack has scrapped the joint peace talks. He's just told Clinton, just let us alone. Just go away, Bill, and let us alone for a few months. You've made a fine mess of this situation, and we just don't need your help anymore. London Times says the Palestinians are snubbing Clinton. It's like nobody wants Bill around anymore. And uh, also the Likud party says today that Ehud Barak will not last, that his government is going to fall any day. I'm Rick Wiles. This is American Freedom News. When I come back, I'm going to tell you about Al Gore's connection to the KGB. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the citizen reporter on the cutting edge of today's news. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the people's news reporter. This is Dr. John Wilkie with the Life Jewel. In in vitro fertilization, a human sperm and a human ovum are brought together in a laboratory. The result of their union is the creation of a single-celled living human, male or female. One problem is the pick of the litter, as it's called. You see, the scientist may fertilize six ovum, have in front of him six new living humans, then choose four, perhaps, to implant in a woman's womb and kill the other two. In the freeze-thaw process, as many as 50% die, and that's just another way of killing them. Finally, 
Of those that are implanted, only 7% survive to develop into full-term babies. I think it's obvious that in vitro fertilization is not safe for most living humans. This is Dr. John Wilkie. Standing up for faith, family, and freedom. You're listening to Rick Wiles. And now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. Welcome back to American Freedom News. I was just informed by my staff here, uh, we've had a, a, a technical crash with the live Internet feed. Uh, we don't know what's going on. We've been told um, that our Internet transmission has gone down. Uh, it's not here at our office. It's somewhere uh, between our studio and uh, the servers that send, uh, send the program out live to the Internet. Oh, uh, you don't think somebody would shut us down, do you, during the middle of a webcast explaining that there are lies and stories and dis, uh, uh, deception about the USS Cole? No, thank you. No, no, they wouldn't do anything like that to us. Well, anyhow, we're down. Uh, we'll Obviously, uh, we'll get this uh, program on the Internet later today, but I'm only going to do a one-hour program. I'm going to cut it short in... In uh, at at the uh, top of the hour, because we're not uh, we're not webcasting live right now. I do a two-hour webcast uh, every day, and uh, as I said, we're we're down. Something has happened out there on the uh, in the transmission lines through the internet. Well, bless their little hearts. One way or the other, we're going to keep informing the American people about what's happening. Hey, I yesterday I was telling you about um, the uh, strange case of the passenger at Logan International Airport in Boston. Uh, let's see, that happened uh, Tuesday. You know, today's Thursday, right? Yeah, it happened Tuesday. Uh, one of our listeners notified us uh, while we were on the air, live uh, on the webcast Tuesday afternoon. This had just broke out in, in the, on, the, on the wire service, and he told us about it, uh, Rob, out in, in St. Louis. Anyhow, said that, that uh, passengers were terrified. I think it was a Delta Airlines flight. Uh, passengers were terrified sitting on the ground at Logan International Airport because one of the passengers was bleeding out of his eyeballs. How would you like to look or look over at the guy sitting next to you and, and his eyeballs are bleeding? He is looking at you, kid. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, anyhow, they, they you know, the, the, the uh, pilot and the crew uh, alerted uh, medical authorities. They came onto the jetliner wearing their spacesuits, and they, they carried the guy out, and they quarantined the plane. And, of course, all the passengers sitting on the plane were terrified of what was happening. Now, this comes on the heels of an Ebola outbreak in Uganda. And so... We reported that Tuesday. Well, yesterday, the report came out that, hey, everything is all right. The guy simply had conjunctivitis. That's all it was, conjunctivitis. In other words, he had a really bad case of pink eye. It was so bad he was bleeding out of his eyeballs. That's really, that's that's the worst case of pink eye I've ever heard in my life. Of course, I guess it... it it gives new meaning to flying the red eye. That's, that's what he was on. He was on the red eye flight. And he was on the bloody eye flight. But that's what they're saying now. Here, here's a UPI article. Health officials say a man who became violently ill aboard a Delta Airlines flight and appeared to be bleeding from his eyes was only suffering from acute conjunctivitis. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm trying not to laugh. Don't reading this stuff, folks. Passengers and crew aboard Flight 350 were quarantined after the Boeing 767 landed at Boston's Logan International Airport Tuesday. The man identified as a 44-year-old resident of Maine. Public health officials said that, quote, there didn't appear to be anything that necessitated holding him or posed a threat to public health. Severe conjunctiv conjunctivitis, hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, 
hemorrhagic, that's when you're bleeding, conjunctivitis, which is basically pink eye. So he had bleeding pink eye. That's the medical prognosis, prognosis here. Now, put this together with another report that I gave you several days ago. I think this was on Monday. That a man in Wisconsin died last week, last weekend, and that uh, doctors in Wisconsin had not ruled out Ebola as the cause of his death. Guess what he died from? Yep. You got it. Let me read the line here to you. This is from the Wisconsin State Journal in Madison. Public health officials are continuing to investigate the death of a Madison man Thursday, but they think it's unlikely he died uh, from a hemorrhagic virus. That means it is unlikely there is any danger to the public. About 10 people who, uh, who had come in contact with the man have voluntarily restricted themselves to their home until the cause of the death is determined. See, they won't say what it is. Uh, down here it says, after an autopsy, Dr. Johnson said there was less likelihood that the man had died of Ebola. Some of the first responders to the scene jumped to that conclusion. Based on preliminary findings, we think it's not very likely. And, of course, you're not hearing anything about singer Liza Minnelli, uh, who was found uh, a few days ago uh, on the floor of her, I don't know, I think her hotel room in, in Miami Beach, or Miami, Florida, uh, her head swollen up the size of a basketball, brain inflammation, uh, delirious, out of her mind. She was rushed to the hospital. They said it was nothing serious, just possibly, a, you know, something rare like an insect bite, and she had an allergic reaction to it. Yes, yeah, called West Nile virus. I reported about a month or two ago about the family in Minnesota, a farm family, six people in a family treated for gastronomical or gastro something, anthrax poisoning, gastrointestinal anthrax poisoning. First case in the history of North America that somebody was poisoned with anthrax. Internally, a family of six, they ate cattle, ate a dead, uh, a dead cow. They butchered a cow on their farm, and the cow had uh, anthrax poisoning. But there's also anthrax spreading throughout Minnesota, Canada, as far west as Utah and Reno, Nevada. You're not hearing any of this on the mainstream news media. This is American Freedom News, and we're daring to report the truth that Dan Rather and Peter Jennings won't tell you. And we're trying to put out as much information and data as we can possibly do every single day. Hey, listen, this is your network, and I haven't built this. You have built it. I, I, it's impossible for me to, to have, have accomplished uh, what, what uh, we have done in the past year and a half, particularly in the last uh, six, eight months, as this, uh, this operation has really grown, it's impossible for me to do it. You have done it. This is your network. You're building it. You are building a brand new news network for the United States of America. It belongs to you, and you're doing it, and I thank you, and I deeply appreciate it. Every single day that I walk in here in the morning, I thank God for what he has done for us, and I, I look at this building, I look at this office, I look at the staff, and I and I'm I, I'm totally in amazement and and wonder at how God has put this together, and the only way that we've made it this far is because you have stood with us, you've helped us, you you've reached down into your wallets and you've you've financed me. I I don't have the money to do this, and I don't stop to think about where the money's going to come from. I try not to even look at the balance in the checkbook and. When the staff comes and says, hey, Rick, do you realize how much money's left in the account? Uh, we have $103, you know. I, just, I don't want to look at it because I know that tomorrow God supplies again. It's like manna. I, I refuse to look at the facts. I just know God supplies. And sometimes he speaks to a person to send $10, and sometimes he speaks to someone to, to send $5,000. I just know that when I need it, it shows up. And, and I appreciate those of you who are helping us. If you want to uh, continue to help us, and, and we could use some support this week, 
You can make a donation check out to America's Hope and send it to P.O. Box 459. That's P.O. Box 459, Granbury, Texas, G-R-A-N-B-U-R-Y, State of Texas, zip code 76048. Or you can call us at 817-579-7557. Again, the mailing address, P.O. Box 459, Granbury, Texas, 76048. Again, if you're making a donation, well, it's up to you. If you want, you know, we have a nonprofit organization, the ministry, America's Hope, and we have American Freedom News. We've separated the two for bookkeeping purposes and for other reasons. But it's up to you. If some people want to make their donations to America's Hope for uh, tax purposes, a lot of you could, you know, you don't give a rip about that because you don't even recognize the IRS exists. That's up to you, however you want to make it out. But we appreciate your support and your help, uh, and we're going to continue going forward with your help and your prayers, and, and particularly your prayers. Like right now, today, while I'm talking right now, here it is, 1250, on Thursday afternoon, and our, our Internet line has gone down. Something has happened while I'm sending out this webcast on the Internet. We've gone down. Folks, we need prayer. And I, I appreciate you who are covering us in prayer on a daily basis. I want to get this stuff on Al Gore. Washington Times says the State Department officials admitted yesterday that details of a secret deal between Al Gore and Russian Prime Minister Viktor Chernominden were kept secret from Congress, but they insisted that the understandings with Moscow help curb weapons transfers to Iran despite an apparent violation of a 1992 law uh, that banned those transfers. Of course, said the uh, spokesman John Parker, Assistant uh, Deputy Secretary of State. He said, of course, certain sensitive documents were classified and were closely held in the executive branch. This is common practice for all administrations on very sensitive diplomatic negotiations. But the thrust of these documents were widely telegraphed to both the Congress and the American people. Well, that's just the opposite of what Gore's letter to Turnamendon said. He said, keep these documents from the eyes of the U.S. Congress. Well, Al Gore has had a long, long relationship with the Russians. Just as Bilderberger Bill has been in the hip pockets of the Chinese, Al Gore has been in the hip pockets of the KGB for a number of years. Now, I'm going to read uh, two Russian news agency articles. I, I was hoping to get this on the website before I went on the air today. I'll, I'll get it on the website later today. But I'm going to read this to you. This comes from uh, a Russian news agency called Echo Mosky. This is a news agency in Moscow. It's been translated from Russian into American. And I'm going to read this to you. Um, it's dated October 5th. Russian State Duma member Aleski Mitrovnov. And he's of the Liberal Democrat Party in Russia. How appropriate. Forwarded an inquiry to the director of the Federal Archive Service, Vladimir Koslov asking him to provide information about the decisions by Soviet Politburo concerning cooperation and relations with President and Chairman of the Board of Directors of Occidental Petroleum Corporation, Armin Hammer, and member of the Board of Directors of the above company and former representative from Tennessee, Albert Gore, Sr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mitro, Mitrovanov. This is the member of the, of the uh, Russian Duma, told the news uh, agency radio station, quote, I already have this information. My purpose is to get it officially. Mitrofanov has said that these, I know that's the third way I've pronounced his name, folks, but listen, this is the main thing here is that we find out what this R Russian Duma member is trying to say. Mitrofanov has said that these archive materials throw light on, quote, the mechanism of supporting Armin Hammer and former Congressman Albert Gore Sr. by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union 
In fact, they were financing Gore's coming out against the Vietnam War, as well as Gore's assistance in closing an FBI investigation against Hammer. Mr. Mitronov, Mitrofanov said, quote, All this is very interesting, especially in connection with the ongoing presidential campaign in the United States. Now listen to his next statement. The incumbent Bill Clinton also started his political career on money given by Hammer, or, in fact, on Soviet money. Everybody knows that Hammer got his most profitable contracts in the Soviet Union on Politburo decisions. Moreover, the Democratic candidate for U.S. President, Al Gore, also started his career on Hammer's money. Folks, this is a, this is a, a statement from the Echo Mosky News Agency in Moscow, October 5th, translated by BBC News from Russian to English. It is, it is quoting a member of the Russian Duma. That's their Congress. And he has submitted what we would call a freedom of information request. He has submitted a request to the Russian Federal Archive Service asking that agency of the Russian government to give him official government documents outlining the amount of money that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, gave to Armin Hammer and to Albert Gore Sr. And then he goes on to say, basically, that everybody, he says, everybody knows Hammer got his most profitable contracts in the Soviet Union. And he says, incumbent President Bill Clinton got his start with Soviet money. And so did Al Gore. He said he got started with Hammer's money. And Hammer's money came from the Soviets. And then this article came out yesterday from the Interfax Russian News Agency. It says, leader of the Russian state Duma's Liberal Democratic Party faction, Alexei Mitrofanov, I finally get it right, told the deputies on Wednesday that he had sent an inquiry to the Federal Archive Service and received a reply concerning, quote, contacts of the Politburo of the Soviet Communist Party Central Committee with well-known American businessman Armin Hammer and Senator Albert Gore. Mitrofanov said, quote, this document is classified and the deputies who would like to read it may do so in exchange for a written statement promising not to disclose its contents. So according to this report that came out yesterday, Interfax Russian News, October 25th, the Duma member Alexei Mitrofanov received his documents this week showing the connection between the Soviet Politburo, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and Armin Hammer and Al Gore. But you won't hear Dan Rather giving that report tonight. You're not going to see CNN stating that a, a Russian Duma member has documents in his, posse, in his possession showing that Al Gore and Bill Clinton got their campaign money start from Soviet Communist Party money. But just, uh, just what is Al Gore's connections to Arm & Hammer? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on the website later, uh, possibly by tomorrow, another article that I'm writing about Al Gore's shady connections with Arm & Hammer. Now, this article was written by the Independent newspaper in London. It, it came out in May of, of uh, 2000. The headline, Al Gore's family linked to corrupt oil man. Why the vice president knows so much about Russia. Tycoon Arm and Hammer had politicians' far, father in his back pocket. This article says, uh, early in the U.S. presidential campaign, Vice President Al Gore's attempt to follow President Clinton in the White House was almost capsized by allegations that he had turned a blind eye to corruption in Russia. The vice president was vulnerable because between 1993 and 1998, he took the leading role in formulating U.S. policy towards Russia. Now just look at this. In the Clinton-Gore administration, 
Clinton was in charge of all relationships with China. But Gore was in charge of all relationships with Russia. They just split up their duties working with the various communist parties. Now this is a London Independent newspaper article, May 21st, 2000. It says, criticism of, vice, of the vice president over the Chernomendan Gore Commission missed the real target, say sources in Moscow. He was telling the truth when he said he knew a great deal about Russia. He could not publicly explain, however, that his knowledge stemmed from the extraordinary relationship between his father, Al Gore Sr., and Armin Hammer, the American multimillionaire who, after meeting Lenin, became the Soviet Union's first foreign investor in 1921. Hammer also served, according to secret Soviet documents, as the conduit for laundering communist money to Soviet intelligence agents and communist organizations in the United States. They quote a diplomat in Moscow as saying, quote, The American press missed the point over the gore Chernomendan scandal. Gore had access to the Soviets and then the Russian leadership long before he met Chernomendan because of his father's links to Hammer and Hammer's high-level contacts in the Soviet Union. And what are those contacts? Well, first of all, Al Gore Jr. is the uh, is in you know he he owns what is it about uh, uh, is I think it's like a half million shares in Occidental Petroleum Oil. And his dad, Al Gore Sr., was given those shares from Armin Hammer. Armin Hammer was a was a dedicated communist. Same dedicated communist that Reverend Robert Schuller was a close friends with. Armin Hammer was a major contributor to Robert Schuller's Hour of Power ministry, which explains why Robert Schuller had Mikhail Gorbachev at his church last week, speaking on the Hour of, Pro- of Power program, and Robert Schuller saying that in his eyes, Mikhail Gorbachev is equal to Abraham Lincoln. Listen, I'm going to get into this tomorrow. I've got more information on Gore's connections to the Soviet communists. Uh, Gore was getting $20,000 a year for mineral rights on his farm. i got to go. Listen, we're going to sign off early. I'll see you tomorrow, American Freedom News. You've been listening to American Freedom News with Rick Wiles. To contact Rick, write to American Freedom News, Post Office Box 459, Granbury, Texas, 76048. Call 817-578-3838. Visit us on the Internet at AmericanFreedomNews.com. Listen Monday through Friday to American Freedom News, news you'll never hear on television. The only way we're going to get the truth on this thing is to just keep shaking our heads, no. Every time the Pentagon spins a story, we need to shake our heads and go, nope, don't believe it, answer the questions. Let's back up to day one, and let's start answering the questions from the, um, the stories you told the first week. Because you're, you're now on to version two or version three. I don't know how many versions we've got out there now by the Pentagon about what happened. I'm going to get back to this in a few minutes, but uh, let me I'll give you a quick update on what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, this is from Israel. Intelligence community monitoring Iraqi troop movements. This is, a, this is a news article out of Israel. As the unrest continues in Israel, the eyes of the Western community are once again focused on the actions of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. Israel and the United States are carefully monitoring Iraqi troop movements on the Iraqi border with Jordan and Syria. 
A, a senior member of Israel's intelligence community confirmed this on Tuesday. The unnamed senior intelligence official acknowledged that recent Iraqi troop movements may be harmless, but quickly added that during the Gulf War he saw we saw what the Iraqi troops did to Kuwait, adding that the Iraqi force could easily pass through Jordan on its way today, Thursday, around the hotel housing U.S. investigators looking into the attack on the USS Cole. The officials said a telephone th a threat from an unknown caller was received around midnight. Yemeni and U.S. security officials held an emergency meeting in the early hours of the morning and adopted new security precautions, including ringing the hotel with machine gun mounted military vehicles and stopping civilian traffic from approaching any closer than 500 yards. The bomb threat to the investigators came as the FBI technicians finished gathering evidence from the ship and were about to head home. After some departures the day before, those remaining uh, at the hotel are around 80 technicians. They're scheduled to leave today. Another report, uh, this is Newsday, Associated Press. Security was tightened today around the hotel. Uh, basically the same uh, information, nothing uh, any different in this. Uh, says the technicians had been steadily sending evidence to the United States for analysis. Uh, one of the articles I've got on, on our website uh, is, uh, uh, is a translation from BBC News of an interview held on uh, an Arab television channel with the president of, of Yemen, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And he clearly was, well, he was being very diplomatic. And at the White House, 17 coffins rolled down the aisle of churches to their graves. And the least that can be done here is that some heads of top brass and some bureaucrats also roll in the next couple weeks as somebody held... Somebody should be held responsible for this. You know, it would be. You know, it would do us some good. You know, to to uh, bring some of the Japanese values into our government because with the Japanese and their government and and in their corporations, when a CEO or an executive is is found to be negligent, you know what the first thing the Japanese do? They resign. They resign in shame. And they don't wait until the lynch mob is outside uh, with the noose ready to drag them out. No, they have a code of honor, and they say, I take responsibility for this, and I am, I'm ashamed of this. I've been negligent, and I am resigning my position. Well, listen, <laughs> Bill Clinton, you couldn't shame that man into resignation if you had a videotape of him in, in, in child molestation. And the news media would... Uh, Explain it away. They would say child molestation does not rise to the level of an impeachable offense. When I come back, I've got more reports. Uh, there have been terrorist threats yesterday and today against the FBI. Mitrofanov said, quote, this document is classified, and the deputies who would like to read it may do so in exchange for a written statement promising not to disclose its contents. So according to this report that came out yesterday, Interfax Russian News, October 25th, the Duma member, Alexei Mitrofanov, received his documents this week showing the connection between the Soviet Politburo, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and Armin Hammer and Al Gore. But you won't hear Dan Rather giving that report tonight. You're not going to see CNN stating that a, a Russian Duma member has documents in his, in his possession showing that Al Gore and Bill Clinton got their campaign money start from Soviet Communist Party money. But just, uh, just what is Al Gore's connections to Arm & Hammer? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on the website later... Uh, possibly by tomorrow, another article that I'm writing about Al Gore's shady connections with Arm & Hammer. Now, this article was written by the Independent newspaper in London. It, it came out in May of, of uh, 2000. Stay tuned for an American Minute with Bill Federer. On this day, October 26, 1774, 
the Provincial Congress of Massachusetts reorganized their defense with one-third of their regiment being Minutemen. They were known as such because they would be ready to fight at a minute's notice. The Congress charged the Minutemen, you are placed by providence in the post of honor because it is the post of danger. The eyes not only of North America and the whole British Empire, but all of Europe are upon you. Let us be solicitous that nothing unbecoming of our characters as Americans, as citizens, and Christians be justly chargeable to us. This has been an American Minute with Bill Federer. For a free transcript, call American Minute at 1-888-USA-WORD. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect news reporter in America. Now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. CNN is uh, reporting today, this is uh, at the time of doing this uh, webcast, uh, concerned about terrorist threats against U.S. forces, the latest being a bomb warning at the Yemen Hotel housing investigators in the attack on the USS Cole. Pentagon leaders Thursday plan to discuss security measures with U.S. military commanders. 888-USA-WORD. You're listening to Rick Wiles, the most politically incorrect news reporter in America. And now, here is citizen reporter Rick Wiles. CNN is uh, reporting today, this is uh, at the time of doing this uh, webcast, uh, concerned about terrorist threats against U.S. forces the latest being a bomb warning at the Yemen Hotel housing investigators in the attack on the USS Cole. Pentagon leaders Thursday plan to discuss security measures with U.S. military commanders around the world. Using a secure video telecommunication link in the Pentagon, Defense Secretary William Cohen and Army General Henry Shelton uh, were to confer with the commanders of all regional commands. Oh, I wonder why they didn't use that secure video telecommunication link with uh, U.S. military commanders around the world two weeks ago when they were getting these threats of a bomb attack against a U.S. ship. The article, this is CNN, says uh, that includes uh, the U.S. Central Command, which is responsible for U.S. forces in the Middle East. Uh, in Yemen, after a bomb threat was phoned into the Aden Hotel, already tight just after the day of the attack, because his superiors refused to give the Navy information. His superiors refused to give the Navy the information he believed might have averted the bombing. In another case, an intelligence report was issued just 12 hours before the coal bombing, indicating possible terrorist activity in Yemen but it was not considered specific enough to call off the Coles' visit to the Port of Aden, said Walter Slocum. Listen, I've said for nearly two weeks now, heads need to roll in the Pentagon, and heads need to be rolling in the, uh, in the State Department and at the White House. Seventeen coffins rolled down the aisle of churches to their graves. And the least that can be done here is that some heads of top brass and some bureaucrats also roll in the next couple weeks as somebody held, somebody should be held responsible for this. You know, it would be, you know, it would do us some good, you know, to to, uh, bring some of the Japanese values into our government. Because with the Japanese and their government and, and their corporations, when a CEO or an executive is is found to be negligent. You know what the first thing the Japanese do? They resign. They resign in shame. Hammers money. Folks, this is a this is a a statement from the Echo Moskvi news agency in Moscow, October fifth. Translated by BBC News from Russian to English. It is it is quoting a member of the Russian Duma. That's their Congress. And he has submitted what we would call a freedom of information request. He has submitted a request to the Russian Federal Archive Service asking that agency of the Russian government 
to give him official government documents outlining the amount of money that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, gave to Armin Hammer and to Albert Gore Sr. And then he goes on to say, basically, that everybody, he says, everybody knows Hammer got his most profitable contracts in the Soviet Union. And he says, incumbent President Bill Clinton got his start with Soviet money. And so did Al Gore. He said he got started with Hammer's money, and Hammer's money came from the Soviets. And then this article came out yesterday from the Interfax Russian News Agency. It says, leader of the Russian state Duma's Liberal Democratic Party faction elect, uh, to the occupied Palestinian territory, including Jerusalem. Ambassador Syed Hassan of Iraq speaking on behalf of the League of Arab States, endorsed the Palestinian request for a U.N. military force. And the Red Dragon is sticking its big head into the Middle East. This report from Reuters today says China says that it is supporting the Arab states' strategic choice of dialogue. That's, that's China's words. In the Middle East peacekeeping and expresses its concern over the violence against the Palestinians by the Israelis. China's uh, foreign minister said, quote, China supports the Arab states in the dialogue to, re to solve the problems of the Middle East. Also, behind the scenes, the Russians are, are doing a lot of meddling in, inside the Arab nations. Everybody knows this thing's going to erupt into a global war. And they know the United States will be on the side of Israel, and everybody else is going to be on the side of the Palestinians. And uh, Russia and the Chinese are, are obviously telling the Arabs, we'll line up with you if you will line up with us when we go after the Americans. Guardian Observer says uh, uh, Israeli citizens are making their own arrangements to protect them so, so they don't sit. Put a little fire under them and make them answer uh, the questions. Here's another Washington Post report. U.S. had hints of possible attacks before coal was hit. U.S. intelligence agencies repeatedly picked up indications of a possible terrorist attack in the Persian Gulf in the days and weeks before the October 12th bombing of the coal. But the warnings were not always relayed to military commanders. A Pentagon counterterrorism counter specialist resigned in protest after the day of the attack because... His superiors refused to give the Navy information. His superiors refused to give the Navy the information he believed might have averted the bombing. In another case, an intelligence report was issued just 12 hours before the coal bombing, indicating possible terrorist activity in Yemen. But it was not considered specific enough to call off the coal's visit to the port of Aden, said Walter Slocum. Listen, I've said for nearly two weeks now, heads need to roll in the Pentagon and heads need to be rolling in the, uh, in the State Department and at the White House. Seventeen coffins rolled down the aisle of churches to their graves. And the least that can be done is those bad guys that we're told that they, that they are or are they CIA boogeymen? Uh, do they work with the CIA? Do they simply perform their role? You know, as Saddam Hussein told, okay, it's time for you to um, move your troops around. And uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, here, here, are some, uh, here are some missiles you need to use to, to, to damage some U.S. warships. You know, we need you to play your part right now. We're, we're fixing to, to launch uh, World War III. I don't know. I just don't trust anything that comes out of the White House today. Uh, another report says uh, the Fatah faction aligned with the PLO has published a new flyer calling for an increase in attacks against Israeli citizens. The flyer, which was distributed Wednesday in Ramallah, called for attacks inside Israel. Uh, some uh, it goes on to say that uh, they're calling for a continuation of the Intifada. Also, we had a today 
a, a suicide bomb in Israel. BBC News says a Palestinian has died in a suicide bomb attack next to an Israeli army post in the Gaza Strip. The man uh, was reportedly a member of the Islamic Jihad movement, came after Israeli and Palestinian security officials reported no progress in talks between the Israeli and Palestinian security officials. And the, after the attack, the capital is in another city. It's not Aden. And whenever I hear attache, I, I automatically think of CIA agent. This thing smells. This thing stinks. Something, um, Something's happening. Something has happened here with the USS Cole that the American people don't know about, that the Congress doesn't know about, that the FBI doesn't know about that much, much of the government doesn't know about, but the shadow government does. The secret shadow government in Washington knows all about it. Washington Post says President of Yemen said today that an Egyptian man has emerged as the one suspect in the bombing, and it's uh, linked to Osama bin Laden. BBC News, Yemen bomb suspects held by Yemenis. Listen, the only way we're going to get the truth on this thing is to just keep shaking our heads, no. Every time the Pentagon spins a story, we need to shake our heads and go, nope, don't believe it, answer the questions. Let's back up to day one, and let's start answering the questions from the, um, the stories you told the first week. Because you're, you're now on to version 2 or version 3. I don't know how many versions we've got out there now by the Pentagon about what happened. I and Yemeni investigators had led to a tentative conclusion that the suspects belonged to an Islamic militant group that he named Islamic Jihad. He identified the groups as Arabs who joined the Arab American-backed Muslim guerrillas that drove Soviet forces from Afghanistan in the 1980s. Yeah, that's the group that the CIA trained and equipped. Remember, the witness who saw the two Arabs go out in that boat, and it was clearly identified on the first day as a Zodiac boat, one of the favorite boats of, of uh, spies and special op forces, the, 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 the witness who saw that boat go out there, remember the story was it went out to help with the mooring lines. The boat, the USS Cole was just coming into the port. This rubber boat, a Zodiac boat, goes out there to help with the mooring. They were very specific about it. And I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes here. I'm going to read the, the statements of the Pentagon officials. They were very specific about describing the Zodiac boat. Well, that witness, although he's never been named, what I do know is that he is a military attache to the U.S. Embassy in Yemen, which is the capital is in another city. It's not Aden. And whenever I hear attache, I, I automatically think of CIA agent contained in the analysis that suggests two or three other major acts of terrorism could potentially occur in the coming weeks or months. A Washington Times article says the agent's assessment was at least the second warning of terror attacks in the region that circulated inside the Clinton administration, but never reached the Coles crew. Senators questioned administration witnesses about a report in the Washington Times yesterday that said the National Security Agency issued a top-secret report hours after the Cole was attacked. And that report said terrorists were planning and organizing attacks on U.S. interests in the Gulf. Walter Slocum under Secretary of Defense for Policy, confirmed the message's existence, but he took issue with how the Times characterized it. Slocum said, I have seen the message in question, and I think it's highly questionable whether those messages constitute what the Washington Times story says they constitute. Whatever that means. General Tommy Franks, commander of U.S. Gulf Forces, said that if he had, if he had, had such a message... He would have ordered force protection measures. General Franks told the senators, quote, if that message contained those specific factors that indicated not only intent, but that there was an, an attack imminent, yes, Senator, we would have taken immediate action. Now this is, uh, and let's start answering the questions 
from the um, the stories you told the first week. Because you're you're now on to version two or version three. I don't know how many versions we've got out there now by the Pentagon about what happened. I'm going to get back to this in a few minutes, but uh, let me I'll give you a quick update on what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, this is from Israel. Intelligence community monitoring Iraqi troop movements. This is a this is a news article out of Israel. As the unrest continues in Israel, the eyes of the Western community are once again focused on the actions of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. Israel and the United States are carefully monitoring Iraqi troop movements on the Iraqi border with Jordan and Syria. A, a senior member of Israel's intelligence community confirmed this on Tuesday. The unnamed senior intelligence official acknowledged that recent Iraqi troop movements may be harmless, but quickly added that during the Gulf War he saw we saw what the Iraqi troops did to Kuwait, adding that the Iraqi force could easily pass through Jordan on its way to Israel. The Israeli Defense Force Intelligence is reporting uh, that they indicate that Saddam may send combat aircraft over heavy population centers, even before advancing ground forces. Questions. Let's back up to day one, and let's start answering the questions from the um, the stories you told the first week. Because you're you're now on to version two or version three. I don't know how many versions we've got out there now by the Pentagon about what happened. I'm going to get back to this in a few minutes, but uh, let me I'll give you a quick update on what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, this is from Israel. Intelligence community monitoring Iraqi troop movements. This is a this is a news article out of Israel. As the unrest continues in Israel, the eyes of the Western community are once again focused on the actions of Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. Israel and the United States are carefully monitoring Iraqi troop movements on the Iraqi border with Jordan and Syria. A, a senior member of Israel's intelligence community confirmed this on Tuesday. The unnamed senior intelligence official acknowledged that recent Iraqi troop movements may be harmless, but quickly added that during the Gulf War he saw we saw what the Iraqi troops did to Kuwait, adding that the Iraqi force could easily pass through Jordan on its way to Israel. The Israeli Defense Force Intelligence is reporting uh, that they indicate that Saddam may send combat aircraft over heavy population centers, even before